everyone. Am I on? I am on. Good morning. Lovely to see you. How are you doing today? Doing all right? I'm, I'm, do, I'm, I'm feeling good heart today, and there's a number of reasons for that. One of which is um, a bunch of us from this church went to um, minister to a gathering of the Vineyard National Directors yesterday. So there's a, there's a number of association of Vineyard churches. We're part of a global family, and they were gathering together just a few miles away from here, and a bunch of us went to um, just be with them for the morning. And the Lord was so present, and it was a beautiful thing. And just also today, so Beth and my wife has just gone down to pick up uh, Damas and Glenda Kamfwa, who lead the vineyard churches in Zambia. And so they are going to be here for our 11.15 service. So that's one. If you can hang around for coffee, hang around for coffee and say hello to them. Particularly if you're African. Give them, give them a good African welcome, right? That would be amazing. Wonderful. So I want to take us back to a story that I shared about a month ago. I shared a picture of our garden at home, which we love, we feel very blessed by. And in the, the right-hand side there, that's our sort of summer house shed, which covers a multitude of sins, you know, barbecue, cushions, all of that kind of stuff. Do you remember then Storm Eunice came through, got a bit windy, this happened... Our shed roof ended up in next door's garden. And and I shared that what we'd found was that when our summer house had been moved a few years ago, it had been taken apart and moved, that the roof hadn't been reattached to the sides. So, it looked great on the outside, but there was clearly an issue going on under the surface. Now, with the benefit of hindsight, there is a way that what happened might have been prevented. And what, with the benefit of hindsight, we could have done was checked under the surface and had a look and seen that it wasn't attached, and we could have taken action if we had known. And that's just a picture of this journey that we've been going on in this Inside Out series. We've been taking time to reflect and think about and examine how our lives have been formed what beliefs and attitudes and values have been formed in us under the surface. And there's a couple of reasons why that's important, why we've been doing that. First is, the stuff underneath that we try and keep hidden will sooner or later rise to the surface, and often with a bit of a bang. The second reason is that one of God's purposes for every human being, I believe, is that we are formed, or that Christ is formed in us. That's what Paul writes in Galatians chapter 4. That is a a, a part of the heart of God's invitation to all of us, that we say yes to being transformed and reformed by the redemptive love of Jesus Christ, by the power of his Holy Spirit. We can become more like Jesus Christ. And I I don't know about you, but when I read the Bible, I look at the life of Jesus and I think, that's amazing. There there is, in my view, there has been nobody that's walked the face of this earth like Jesus. Yes, he was the son of God, but he was fully human as well. And I look at his life and I say, I want to be more like that. And the good news is that when Paul writes to us that Christ can be formed in us, that's an invitation to become more like him. And so that is, that is true for all of us here. Whether or not you would, you'd call yourself a Christian, a follower of Jesus, whether or not you've given your yes to Jesus, I hope that one of the things that every one of us hears today is an invitation into that life. That our lives can be transformed, reformed, restoried by Jesus Christ. So a quick reminder of our journey so far, we've thought about having healthy rhythms, we've thought about being different together, we engaged with the topic of race and ethnicity. And then Rob tackled the really easy topic last week of living as sexually whole beings. And, you know, just such... I I give Rob all the easy talks, right? Because that's part of my gift as the senior pastor here that I I get. Anyway, we'll move on, because we love Rob. (laughs) So um, we've pointed out a few things that are coming up in the life of our church. There's a worship night on the 10th of April, where that is around uh, not only worshipping, but also processing some of the things we might be experiencing in this area of race and ethnicity. We want to create space where we can bring that into the presence of Jesus and we can meet his healing touch. 
There's a question time on Wednesday, the 4th of May, again in the area of race and ethnicity. We're gathering a panel of people, and we can simply come with questions and ask and listen. Um, There's a bunch of new resources on our website, which uh, we point you towards. We're going to run 100 shared tables again, where our invitation will be to invite someone who's of a different ethnicity to you to a table of your choice. And we're going to run that in June. Um, And then last Sunday, Rob pointed to a uh, kind of a Saturday morning session on the 7th of May around growing in sexual wholeness. And there's going to be a stream for married people and a stream for single people. And you can sign up for that online. And that's going to be a great morning as well. What we're going to do today is think about how we can live deeper in what I think in many ways is a very shallow world. A theologian called Ronald Rollheiser writes this, the air we breathe today is generally not conducive to interiority and depth. In other words, we live in a pretty shallow world. We live on the tip of the iceberg, the bit that's visible to other people, but 90% of our lives is below the surface. You see, the world that we live in really values kind of like the clothes that we're wearing, the food that we're eating. I mean, how many of you put pictures of food out on social media and Why do we do that? If we didn't care what people thought, why would we do that? It cares about our job title, our career, all of that kind of stuff, which is pretty superficial in lots of ways. And we so often live in ways that either consciously or subconsciously avoid looking beneath the surface. Our world is configured that way. And so I want to think about how can we go beyond that and live a life that's deeper? So if you have a Bible, could you turn to the book of Psalms? Um, The Psalms, in many ways, are models of looking deeper. And we're going to look at Psalm 139 this morning. This is a paper version. It's pretty much bang halfway through. If you've got a digital version, it's down that scroll list. Psalm 139. I'm not going to read it all, but I'm going to start at verse 1. This is written by King David. He says, You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. You hem me in behind and before and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. And I'm just going to jump down to verse 13. You created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well going to pause it. That's stunning verses, isn't it? If you've, if you've read the Bible, these are stunning verses. One thing that they tell us is that God knows us completely. Just 100%. Utterly complete. When you sat down in here, God knew that. For those of you online, if you're sat on your sofa, God knows. When most of us stood up to sing this morning. God knew that. He knows our rising. Wherever you go, God knows. Verse 2, it says, God knows all of our thoughts. Now, I don't know how scientists do this, but scientists have found that the average person has 6,200 thoughts per day. It's a lot of thinking. The average lifespan of someone in the UK is 81.2 years. I did a bit of simple maths. That means the average person in this country thinks 184 million thoughts over their lifetime. And God knows every one of them. And that is true for all other 8 billion people on this planet. I haven't done that math. That's a lot of thoughts. (laughs) a lot of thoughts. The average person speaks 16,000 words per day. And surprisingly, it's pretty the same between men and women. I'm not going further down that avenue. (laughs) Again, 
In an average lifespan of people in the UK, that is 475 million words. Verse 4 says that before each one of them is formed, God knows. And that's true for the other 8 billion people on this planet. And then we're reminded in verses 13 and 14 that before we were born, God knows us. He knit us together. None of us here are a mistake. We're all here because of the creative voice of God. And then the psalmist sums it up, verse 3, he says, You are familiar with all my ways. Now, you've heard me say this before. I looked up the word all, and guess what it means? You're good. (laughs) All means all. He is familiar with all of our ways. Now, before we start to think that God is some kind of divine stalker, the psalmist tells us that this knowing is a good thing. Verse 6, such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. It is a good thing that God knows us completely. We're not going to get our heads around how he can know all of our thoughts and all of our words, and that being true for all of the people on this planet. But it does say a couple of things to me, at least. It does tell me how big God is, that he can do that. And it also tells me something, and it should tell you something, about how much he loves you, that he would bother to do that. That he would bother to pay attention to every thought and every word, and every time you stand up and sit down, he cares. And that should tell you something about the the width and the depth and the height of that love for you. So in light of all of that, David goes on to write this, verses 23 and 24. Search me, God and know my heart. Test me, and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. This is an incredibly important and honest confession. If we want to know what good emotional and spiritual health is, here it is. Because here's the thing. Whilst God knows us completely, we don't fully know ourselves. Whilst God knows us completely, we don't fully know ourselves. You see, good emotional and spiritual health says this. I acknowledge that God knows everything about me, and at the same time, I don't know everything about me. And then we pray a prayer like this. Lord, show me me. Lord, show me me. It's really important. This isn't about navel-gazing. This is about finding freedom. You see, I love the phrase. We read it in verse 24. It says, lead me in the way everlasting. That talks about the kingdom. That talks about the unending, the everlasting, eternal ways of God, but we are being led in them now. That is the inbreaking of the future age of God the future in breaking of heaven into our lives now. And I love that, because when that happens, we find freedom. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, that guarantee of what is to come, the one who comes with us to guarantee what is to come, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So I've suddenly gone up. There we go. We have this beautiful picture of God's perfect life breaking into our worries and anxieties and leading us into freedom. God's kingdom breaking into our offensive ways. We have those, right? Good. There's a bit of honesty in here. Thoughts, beliefs, attitudes that we know are not good, things formed in us often from our families of origin, trauma we've experienced, lies, We've believed, and we need freedom, don't we, friends? Freedom of God's everlasting ways. So this isn't like navel-gazing or endless introspection. You don't get a sense of David turning over every stone in his life, looking for all the stuff that is broken. Being really honest, if I did that, I'd never see the light of day again. 
And you might feel the same. Because if we're really honest, we know there is a whole lot of stuff in our lives we just think, well, that's not very much like Jesus. You know, I wasn't patient like Jesus. I wasn't hopeful like Jesus. I wasn't faith-filled like Jesus. I wasn't kind like Jesus. And so what, what David does here is he invites the Lord to examine his heart. And what I have found, and this I think is some of the grace of God, is that the Lord doesn't reveal all of our issues in one download. If he did that, we would die. This is the love of God, right? The Lord is graciously and lovingly at work in us. And my experience is this, that so often what the Lord does is he puts his finger on something and says, hey, Andy, let's deal with that. Now's the time. We're going we're to work on that. Let me just share a bit of an aside. If you carry some sort of pastoral leadership, maybe you're a small group leader or a team leader or something like that in our church here, we might be aware of a bunch of things in someone's life that we're leading. We know that needs to change and that needs to change and that needs to change. We have love for the people. We can see that stuff, right? It is very tempting to jump in on an issue, but if it's not the thing that the Lord is working on, It rarely goes well. What I have found is that it is far better to wait and see what the Lord is doing in that person's life that you love and you want to see them experience greater freedom, that we wait and we see what the Lord is doing. And when he brings that issue up that you would love to get sorted out, when he brings it up, we can pastorally get involved and bring the truth and the grace of Jesus Christ. But we wait for the Lord. We wait for what he's doing. How many of you have taken your car for a service or MOT? Have you had that kind of experience? I have. Do you you, you remember like you're waiting on the phone, just waiting for the issues to come up? (laughs) Or you might go and get your car, and it's kind of like you get that report, and it's like brakes, tires. It's just you've had that kind of stuff. What you, what you don't want at that point is a report of all of the faults and no solution. No way through, because that's like, that's just down, isn't it? That's depressing. What you want at that moment is someone to say, hey, Andy, this is your car, this is the list of faults, but I have got a route to motoring freedom. And you say, come on. <laughs> I need my car to be safe. I need it on the road. Show me what the route is. We need hope, don't you? When you speak to the garage, you need some hope. We need hope that we can find a way to freedom. Here's our hope. Verses 7 and 8. Let me read them again. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. For me personally, this is one of the most precious things that I love about being a follower of Jesus. And it is simply this, that God is present to us. That he is with us. The psalmist, he's asking a rhetorical question here, right? He says, is there any place that I can go where God is not present? And the answer is, no. That was one of the few occasions when the answer wasn't Jesus. The answer is no. There is no place I can go. God is fully present to you and to me by his spirit. And this is true when things are going well. He says in verse 8, if I go to the heavens. So when life is going well, it sort of feels like you're sat on one of those heavenly clouds playing a harp. You know, the kids are behaving. There's money in the bank. You've got a job. You know, things... Will you find God in that place? Yes. And it is also true when life is a nightmare. He talks about in verse 8, if I make my bed in the depths. And I dug into that a little bit. Now, what does that mean? And in the King James Version, that word is translated hell. I thought, that's interesting. So I don't always get out the Hebrew, but I did this week. And the word that is literally used is a Hebrew word which means the realm 
of the dead. It's where in Hebrew thought they, they, they understood the body to go when the soul had departed. Utterly lifeless. The absolute pit. And that is the imagery that David's bringing here. So when life feels like that, will you find the presence of God? Is God fully present to you by his spirit when life feels like that? And the answer is, yes. Yes, he is. As we become aware of our anxieties and our offensive ways and the wheels are coming off the bus of life, is God present to us? Yes, he is. Now, what we're going to do in small groups this week, so for those that have been tracking with us, half of our series is on Sundays, half is on small groups. We're going to look at some of the barriers we can face to living deeper. We're going to share some practical tools on how we can deal, kind of live more deeply and engage more deeply with our emotions and with our reactions to the stuff that happens in life. So I commend that to you. It's really important that we process the stuff that we live through each day. Why is this important to us? Well, I'm going to, I'm going to share a quote from Rich Villadas. We've been sharing a bunch of stuff from his book over these last few weeks. Rich writes this. Interior examination is a way of life that considers the realities of our inner world for the sake of our own flourishing, in other words, we do better, and the call to love well. In other words, we are going to be a better person to live with for our families, our friends, our work colleagues, our neighbors, if we will pay attention to what's going on under the surface of our lives. I'm coming in for a close here, and I do actually mean that. I'm coming in for a close. I'm just going to read that last sentence again and then just share a last thought with us. David writes this, Lead me in the way everlasting. Lead me in the way everlasting. It seems to me that in so many areas of life, we all need someone that's a little bit ahead of us, right? We, we all want to be led in some way. We want to catch a, a vision, a glimpse of something, and we say, I want to be like that and, and to be led by that. So then, then let me just think about this. Who ultimately can show us how to live a life of depth and freedom and emotional health. Who ultimately can do that? Can you think of anyone who was persecuted but never became bitter? Can you think of anyone? Can you think of anyone who, even though he was betrayed and let down by his closest friends, did not turn on them? Can you think of anyone yet? Can you think of anyone who, at the point of being murdered, said to those people, I forgive you because you don't know what you're doing? Can you think of anyone yet? Can anyone think of anyone yet? This was one of those occasions. <laughs> Look to Jesus, friends. Look to Jesus. Come to Jesus. Ask Jesus for help. Because the beautiful thing is this. Jesus pours out his Holy Spirit to those who come to him. And it's his Spirit who leads us, who guides us, who teaches us, who examines us, who leads us in the way everlasting. And remember... Scripture tells us that this same spirit that the Lord pours out is the same power, that same resurrection power that raised Jesus from the dead. We're not, we're, I mean, I love therapists and counselors, okay? But this is just, this is other. When, when God says to he, that the Holy Spirit is poured out to us as our counselor and our advocate, this is the one who raised Jesus. Jesus from the dead. This is not, if this was an MS advert, this is, this is not any ordinary power. 
This is, this is the power of the future age of the perfection of God's kingdom breaking into our lives now. And so we look to Jesus. We come to Jesus. One of, one of the images that I often dwell with is Jesus on the cross. Because one of the things that I see in that beam across, the, uh, beam across that horizontal beam, is I see the outstretched arms of Jesus. And it says to me, you are welcome. The arms of Jesus are open wide. He is fully present to us. His invitation today is, will you be fully present to him? Come to him, friends. Allow the power of his Holy Spirit to be at work in our lives because there's a better story for each of us. Amen? Amen.